I can start talking. Yeah. Hello, I don't see anything. Okay, hi everybody. This is Loretta Hattie uh, in Charleston. Um, good afternoon, and I thank you all. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Anybody there? Yes. Yeah. They yeah. can hear me. Okay, good. We're extremely pleased to have you for this webinar on such short notice. Um, this webinar is about Biosense 2.0, which is our new electronic uh, syndromic surveillance system. As you may be aware, we never had an electronic sur syndromic surveillance system in West Virginia. And during the last three years, we've been trying to implement CDC's Biosense program in the state. This system at present collects pre-diagnostic data from hospital emergency departments. More than 30 of our 48 hospitals have now been connected to receive data on a daily basis. This webinar aims to invite your attention to this newly available data source so that you can think of ways to utilize it to monitor the health status of your communities. This webinar will be uh, uh, presented in three sections. The first part will explain Biosense program, our efforts to implement Biosense in West Virginia, and a demonstration of the system. Uh, Dr. Anil Nair will be presenting <coughs> this section. Then Dr. D. Bixler, Director of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, will talk about the current use of Biosense at the state level for influenza-like illness, ILI surveillance. And then uh, Suzanne uh, Wilson, our food and waterborne disease epidemiologist, will talk about her experience with the data in Biosense. I hope that you will consider becoming registered users of Biosense. Uh, the system uh, brings a lot of opportunities for you to see data in your community that you haven't had access previously to and to consider using it on a regular basis. Again, thank you uh, for joining us on short notice today, and I'll turn it over to Dee Bixler, or Anil Nair. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. Um, good afternoon, and once again, let me welcome you all to this webinar on Biosense. I'm not sure like how many of you have heard the term biosense before, but I'm sure that you all have heard about syndromic surveillance. Biosense is CDC's syndromic surveillance system. It is an electronic data system. Um, by the way, recently CDC has changed the name to National Syndromic Surveillance Program. So for the time being, I'll be using both these names in this webinar. As Dr. Harry mentioned, we have been trying to implement Biosense in the state during the last three years. Uh, we now have more than 60% of uh, all emergency department uh, visit data sent to public health on a daily basis. Uh, however, the use of the system by various programs and entities at the state and local levels is very limited. There are only about 21 registered users for the program at this time, including four or five users from the local health departments. So as Dr. Hadi mentioned, the aim of this presentation is to invite your attention to this newly available data source, which has information about not just infectious disease, it has information about almost all health conditions affecting the people in our communities. So in, in my part of this webinar, I will be talking about the Biosense program and also about the uh, efforts that we conducted during the last three years to implement this system in West Virginia. Then um, uh, Dr. Bixler and um, Susan Wilson will talk about uh, infectious, the use of the system for uh, influenza-like illnesses and food and waterborne disease surveillance. 
then we will have finally we will have a live demonstration of the system. According to CDC, syndromic surveillance is system is developed as an investigational approach to supplement traditional surveillance activities. It is never intended to replace traditional surveillance. In fact, its utility is limited if it is not used in combination with traditional surveillance methods. As you can see from the definition, the main point is automated collection of data. So that means we are going to get the data much quickly. In fact, it, we are going to have the data before clinical diagnosis or laboratory confirmation is available. Both those factors are the basis for the traditional surveillance system. The system also offers uh, some statistical procedures to develop alerts. So by having more data more quickly, uh, local, state and national public health agencies can identify disease threats and take appropriate actions. Of course, there are different opinions about the ability of syndromic surveillance systems in to identify outbreaks. However, at a minimum, we should be able to use the system to track the health status of our communities and to make sure that nothing unusual is happening at a given point in time. There are different tools for syndromic surveillance. The main one is Essence. Then we have the Biosense developed by CDC and there are other programs as well. We decided to go for Biosense because that was offered freely from by the CDC and not only that, CDC offered technical assistance to implement this program in West Virginia. CDC started Biosense program in 2003 after the implementation of the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act. Initially, the emphasis was, uh, develop, was in developing a system to identify bioterrorism-related threats at the national level. Subsequently, in 2010, CDC redesigned the Biosense program, and at that time, the emphasis changed to, de to develop a system capable of giving situational awareness about all health-related threats, not just uh, bioterrorism-related threats. And they wanted to have that capability at the national, local, and state levels. There are different federal agencies involved in this program. Actually, CDC gave funds to us to develop this environment in, combination, in collaboration with the CST, NACHO and the International Society for Disease Surveillance. In line with the federal government actions, in 2013, the West Virginia State Legislative also passed a rule requiring all emergency departments and urgent care facilities in the state to submit syndromic data for public health surveillance activities. Also in line with the uh, plan to have data sharing, the rule also ensured states authority to share such data with local and local agencies as well as Center for CDC and other federal entities. We can share uh, data at different levels. We can share raw data, county level data, or state level data. And we can share that with, within our jurisdictions or with CDC and other Biosense community members. At present, we are sharing county level data with the CDC. We are not sharing our data with anyone else. I don't know whether you know the fact that Biosense is working on a cloud or is working on a cloud environment. The data are maintained in a cloud system. So naturally, there are concerns about the data security as well as the stability of the system. Biosense data are maintained by Amazon Web Service, and this agency has Federal Information Security Management and HIPAA compliant infrastructure. Not only that, CDC is using some third-party software to continuously challenge the security assumptions of the system. So basically, it is supposed to be a very secure system. Another question is about the stability of the system. What is going to happen if 
the system fails or we are going to lose our data. But that is very unlikely to happen because Biosense data are stored in government cloud that is continuously being backed up on a nightly basis. So if something goes wrong, CDC can bring the data back without much difficulty. Actually, it is supposed to have 99.9% .9 uptime. That means the system may go down or may remain unavailable for a period of one day during a three-year period. If you are interested in knowing more about uh, Biosense, there are some websites. And uh, these websites have plenty of information about Biosense. And one of them is this one that has a Biosense as a library that explains several aspects about using this program on a daily basis. So now let me take a slight deviation and start talking about our efforts for implementing Biosense in West Virginia. As we heard before, we never had an electronic syndromic surveillance system in the state. So we started our efforts to have syndromic surveillance system in 2012. As part of that efforts, we signed a data user agreement with ASTO to participate in the National Syndromic Surveillance Program or the Biosense Program. Later that year, we received a small implementation support grant from CST and we decided to work with the West Virginia Health Information Network at that time in this project because they were working with hospitals in the state for connecting those hospitals to the health information exchange. Later that year, we received a three-year funding. That is the one that I was talking, and that is going to end at the end of this month. <clears throat> so according to that uh, project, uh, the aim was to connect at least 50% of all the West Virginia hospitals with emergency departments to the project before the end of the project. Uh, we selected, uh, there are different options for connecting hospitals to Biosense, but we decided to connect them via the health information exchange. But not all hospitals uh, are not interested in submitting their data to the Biosense, to the health information exchange. So we also offered some provision to have direct connections with the Biosense Cloud. We then established a direct, con direct connection with the Biosense Cloud to access the data. We have also constituted a state-level working group to monitor the implementation activities. Uh, as you may be aware, syndromic surveillance is included in the federal meaningful use program. So the hospitals that decide to submit their data to Biosense or other syndromic surveillance programs are eligible to get financial incentives from federal government. But in order to encourage them, we decided to give them some additional incentives and we uh, started an early adopted grant program to encourage hospitals to submit their syndromic data to the state. And we selected seven hospitals in the second year, and this year we wanted to select at least 15, but we could get only five hospitals. And these selected hospitals received on an average $5,000 to $7,000. Here we have the list of hospitals that are currently submitting data to Biosense. There are 33 of them. We have 48 hospitals in the state with emergency departments, and we have already connected 33 of them. And this list does not include one hospital in Ohio that is in the border, and uh, three urgent care centers attached to hospitals. So here's a map uh, that shows the counties with at least one facility connected to Biosense. As you can see, like uh, there is at least one facility in every uh, regional epidemiologist region. These are the hospitals uh, that are at different stages of onboarding process, and uh, some of them are very close to being connected to the production system. We have some 
minor issues with their data quality and once we get that those issues fixed we will be moving them to production very soon and as part of the grant we also propose to conduct a training program for users in biosense and in fact this webinar is also part of that but the original plan was to have uh, regional in person trainings but we did not have that many users uh, at the uh, local level so and that's why we decided to change the mode of training one expectation with an electronic syndromic surveillance system is to have the ability to conduct even specific surveillance when we uh, conducted surveillance during the 2013 boy scout jamboree we did not have any of the facilities in that region connected to biosense so we had to depend upon paper copies sent from those hospitals to conduct surveillance that was a time consuming and laborious activity so we have been thinking about having a procedure in place to use the electronic system to do the same if we want to do even specific surveillance either planned or unplanned so this process involves adding a specific keyword to the chief complaint field of those records that are somehow related to the particular event and then extracting those records through the back end of the system upon electronic submission we successfully tested this procedure in the in a recent mass gathering event in the state in fact that was tested um, last month Uh, as i said the current grant is ending at is at the end of this month uh, but we have already submitted another grant request for the next 4 years and uh, the, according to the funding opportunity announcement this grant will have emphasis not only on the previous grant was uh, focusing mostly on connecting facilities to the system but this one in addition to expanding coverage will also focus on increasing the use of the system and also in ensuring the quality of the data in the system so in line with these uh, funding opportunity announcement uh, recommendations we have proposed several activities and we will be conducting these activities if we get funded and according to this we would like to onboard at least 25% of the remaining facilities in the first year that includes uh, the remaining hospitals and we have about 66 independent urgent care centers and that are also uh, that 25% of them will also be connected during the first year and we would like to onboard at least two pilot hospitals for in person data and we will also evaluate and improve the utility of the system for surveillance in weather related events we also propose to implement a new infectious disease surveillance system by combining the electronic laboratory reporting system and the syndromic surveillance system so that we can give real time feedback to the emergency departments in the state we will develop and implement a, a tool for regular monitoring for data quality and we will also we have also proposed to constitute an epidemiological work group involving epidemiologists from various programs and academic departments and the you know, universities in the state and physicians in emergency departments the plan is to may do webinars either nationally or internationally in collaboration with the international society for disease surveillance as i mentioned uh, the system has data on Uh, various aspects not just infectious disease even though that is a situation only the infectious disease program is currently using the system but we hope that with expanded coverage more programs and entities will start using this on a regular basis um uh, as an example i have some uh, non infectious syndromes that are included in the system we know that west virginia and many other neighboring states are uh, reported to be in an in a heroin epidemic and the increased use of heroin and other injectable drug has been hypothesized 
to be linked to an increased incidence in hepatitis. Even though this is a this is an important public health problem, there are not many data sources out there to characterize this problem. Biosense has a predefined syndrome in the in the, in the system, which is called poisoning by medicine, and here is a definition for that. Of course, it does not uh, specifically identify cases related to heroin, but we can always identify records with the keyword heroin in the chief compliant field and use that data for subsequent analysis. I have prepared some graphs using the data that I extracted uh, for this particular syndrome in West Virginia. And here is a graph showing the age group distribution of overdose related emergency departments in West Virginia during the period of MMWR week 1 in 2014 to week 20 in 2015. And here is uh, another graph showing the gender distribution using the same data. Uh, this is another graph showing the age and gender distribution of uh, overdose related visits in West Virginia. This is a time series showing the same, the number of cases reported for this particular syndrome. No, I never get on. And as I mentioned, I extracted the records with the keyword heroin in the chief compliant field uh, using this system. And I have a map of counties showing the number of heroin related ED visits. Thank God. Another, another condition that many of us are interested in is uh, heat related illnesses. Here's a predefined syndrome definition for heat related illnesses and I have created some graph using this data and this is the age distribution of heat related uh, ED visits for the previous three years for the period from May 1st to July 1st. Uh, this is uh, gender distribution of heat related ED visits. You have to remember one thing, even though I have used the previous three year period, we did not have that many hospitals submitting data in the system for any of these conditions. So here is another graph showing the heat related ED visits by county during the period from May 1st to July 1st this year. So uh, I was just trying to show you that there are different uh, kind of information that is available in the system that many of us are interested in. So before I move to the live demonstration, I would like uh, to invite Dr. Bixler to talk about how the infectious disease program is used in the system. Thanks very much, Anil. That was a really um, interesting um, set of slides. Um, I am going to start with um, with the showing you a surveillance system that I hope a lot of you are very familiar with. Um, Anil is doing some very new and innovative things with uh, Biosense and we are also using Biosense um, in a way that lots and lots of other states are using it. Um, a lot of you are familiar with uh, syndromic surveillance for influenza-like illness. And if you look on our website any given week, you'll see updated numbers for uh, numbers of um, influenza-like illness by MMWR week and by year. And you can see that this is a system that has served us well um, since long before I arrived in the state. It's a paper-based system. It does a great job in mild influenza seasons. It does a great job in moderate influenza seasons. And it does a great job in severe influenza seasons. We used it in 2003 when there were, that was the first year that there were really lots of issues with pediatric deaths were recognized. And we've used it through, throughout the 2009 pandemic. It's been, it's served us very, very well. Um, 
There are, however, some problems with that system. It's very labor intensive. It's paper based. The reliability is not always 100% during Thanksgiving and Christmas. It tends to kind of bottom out um, because nobody's in the office to get the numbers. Um, we know that providers don't use a standard case definition. We know that we get better reporting from smaller health departments because they have a personal relationship with their providers and not as good reporting from larger health departments. So it doesn't, it's not representative of what's going on. So even though it's a great system in a lot of ways, it's got some challenges. And Biosense promises to overcome a lot of those challenges. Now, I have to give credit where credit is due. Shannon McBee, our influenza coordinator, is the one who has really pushed our move uh, to Biosense. And last year, you can see that she ran all these graphs simultaneously. Here is um, here's the Sentinel provider graph, which is also data that I hope you're very familiar with. And this is data that's collected from individual physicians scattered around the state from last season. And here is the curve from, from Biosense. And so we actually are at a point now where we're getting ready to transition from our old paper-based system that has served us very well to this new electronic system that uh, most other states in the union are using. And I'm hopeful that this will continue uh, to serve as well in the future. Um, please plan to sign on when uh, Shannon does her webinar on influenza next week, and I'm sure she'll be talking more about this. But it is, in my mind, a very, as one who's followed influenza for years, and I think it's a fascinating disease, and and very interesting to do surveillance on. This is this is really a new opportunity for us, and it's actually something that that many local health departments could take advantage as well of as well. If you want to look and see what's going on in your um, local area, all you have to do is to tap into this data source that's now available to you. Um, one other quick thing um, that Shannon worked on um, during the year um, is. Um, enterovirus, as you know, um, during last last fall, we um, had an outbreak of enterovirus EVD 68, and Shannon did um, with along with some other states did some nice work um, tracking that virus. And this is the website that she and um, Brett Armstrong in our program put together, and, and they did a really brilliant job on this. And um, she actually has used um, syndromic surveillance, and here it is, here it is. to follow um, different uh, – um, patterns of respiratory illness during the fall. And this is just an example of how the, the system is, um, can, can be leveraged for a variety of emerging issues, um, and, and really has a lot of promise, I think, for all of us. Now, of course, it's never going to replace notifiable disease surveillance, but you can't you can't uh, do surveillance for everything using notifiable disease surveillance. This is really an excellent, useful um, adjunct tool that I hope um, everybody gets familiar with over the next few years. Um, so can I turn it over now to our, our foodborne um, epidemiologist who's also been experimenting with this and has learned a few interesting things as well. Uh, yes, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you. Just one second. We'll get, I'll get this pulled up here. Um, as you mentioned, I'm going to um, talk to you quickly about um, some of the experience I've had with the Biosense data um, as far as our enteric um, program goes. Um, I evaluated um, the use of the Biosense data for detection of an enteric viral season. Um, I was hopeful that um, the, the data from the system would allow us to um, be able to, to see and um, detect um, things like um, 
enterovirus season and norovirus season and, the, and the, those types of viral enteric illnesses um, through this emergency department surveillance. Um, so in order to do that, I conducted um, a literature review to see um, how, if there, if there had been anything published about how this data was being used um, for enteric um, surveillance. Um, I also contacted my counterparts in other states to see um, what they're doing, mm -hmm. and then I'll let you take a look at um, some of the data. So what you're looking at here um, are the percent of visits, uh, the percent of total visits um, for, in for selected enteric syndromes. Um, you can see that the blue line is for, um, is the most specific, that's just diarrhea explicitly. The red line is um, for nausea and vomiting, and then the green line is um, data or is the visits that would encompass both of those, just sort of a, a more catch-all of just gastrointestinal um, being listed in the chief complaint. Um, so this is for um, the calendar year, or the MMWR year of 2014, um, and so you can see that for um, the year, we, it ranged um, roughly for gastrointestinal illness somewhere between 25 and 15 percent of all emergency department visits were for gastrointestinal um, illness of some sort. Um, but as you can see, there's not really um, any specific um, seasonality that can be noted. It just sort of um, trails along up or down, uh, but no real, no real peaks either way. And so this is the data. Um, up to um, mid-July um, for 2015, and again, you see, um, you know, the same thing. You, there's not really any big spike during the winter months or anything like that, which is what we would typically expect for um, enteric viral illnesses. Um, I know this graph is really busy, um, but this is just to show. I went ahead and pulled, as, as Anil mentioned, we have had the system in place since um, mid-2013, although we have... As he said, we have had very few hospitals submitting data um, at that point, but I just um, graphed each set of lines is for the different years, 2013, 14, and 15, just to show that over the, over the time frame, um, there really wasn't a whole lot of trends. It, it, it kept the same um, sort of trend with no real seasonality shown. Um, and in fact, you'll see um, in the 2013 data, um, there was a spike um, towards towards the November, um, October, November time frame of the year, but that um, for, that does not actually correspond. There was not um, you, we would expect if if there were a true or if if there was a big increase in enteric viral illness during that time that we would have increased reports of outbreaks, and that did not correspond well with that. Um, so unfortunately, what I found um, for the use of, of biosense for enteric surveillance is it's not very useful for um, detection, uh, routine surveillance and detection of um, enteric viral seasonality. And um, that, that um, was similar, that same result was found similarly by other states. It's not being used widely by other states for that particular purpose. Um, what it's most, what biosense can be very useful for um, as far as enteric uh, illness surveillance goes is for event-specific surveillance, so things like mass gatherings um, or particular weather events. Um, it can be useful for um, detection of enteric illnesses during those times. Um, some additional steps that um, I'm going to try um, just to see, I'm going to try to limit the data by age to see if perhaps rotavirus season um, is detectable in children. Um, and so we'll see if maybe that will um, provide some, the data will, will provide some use for us for that as well. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Anil now to give you a demonstration of the system. So uh, this is a screen that you are going to see when you actually log into the bio, when you try to log into the Biosense. Um, I'm trying to log into the system now.
I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, this is what you get once you log in. That gives you the opportunity to enter three information about three fields, what, where, and when. Before we start entering anything, I would like you to invite your attention to this particular question mark just close to the what box. If you click on that, that will get you a document that explains the biosense winning algorithm and the other syndromes, predefined syndromes available in the system. There are about 90 plus syndromes and biosense actually uses, even though it is using mainly the chief complaint information, it can, it has the ability to use diagnosis codes and uh, diagnosis text terms that is in the order of preference. So, for instance, if you are searching for a particular syndrome, it will look for the diagnosis code and if that information is available and matching to the syndrome that you are searching, it will mark that record as belonging to that particular syndrome. If that information is not there, then it will go and look the diagnosis text term and if that is there, that will be used and if that is also not there, then it will look at the chief compliant field to identify the records belonging to that syndrome. So now let us go back and uh, try to see how the system, how we can use the system. Okay, so uh, as I said, it gives you information, uh, opportunity to enter three information. One is what, that is which geographical or what particular condition that you are interested in. Then it will let you enter the geographical region that you are interested in. And then it will also give you the opportunity to enter the time period that you want to study or explore. So I am just going to use one, one condition that is not uh, necessarily an infectious thing. I am going to use motor vehicle accidents. So once you type the first few letters, you will, you will be able to select that item from the system. And then you have to select the where part. Of course, I am going to select West Virginia. So I can select that. And then I can select the time period. Once you click on that box, that will give you the opportunity to select past week, past month, or past year, or if you are interested in a specific date range, you can do that using the calendar available in the system. So I'm just going to, for the time being, I'm just going to use past month. Then you may want to click on this advanced option if you want to make additional selections. One thing you may want to select is the sources because, you know, there are other entities or other jurisdictions that have agreed to share their uh, aggregate data with, the, with other states and many states have decided to do so. So, I am going to unselect all of them and then select only the West Virginia information. I am not going to make any changes in the demographics or the age range, but if you are really interested in seeing the numbers just for a particular gender category or age group, you have the opportunity to do that here. Then we click on the Go button. So that will bring up a graph that is showing the number of 
visits related to that particular syndrome that you selected for the time period. And by default, it is going to show you the number of visits. But if you want to see that as the percentage of total visits for the same time period, for the same jurisdiction, you can click on this radio button to get that information. And if you are interested in seeing that as a population rate, you can do that here. And if you want to see the numbers for a week, then you can select this radio button that is representing the week. And if you want to see the numbers for a month, you can select that too. And once you see this, and if you want to compare the numbers with a previous year, you have the option. Even though there are the years uh, given here are ranging from 2010, we did not have data for that period. So I'm just going to see how this works and I'm selecting the 2014 time period. So that will show you the graph for the same time period, for the same geographical region, for the same syndrome. So you, if you want to visually compare the data, you can do that. And the system also gives you an opportunity to show the tabular data behind this graph. So for that, you have to select this radio button. And that will give you the opportunity to select different, uh, different options to categorize the data. For instance, you can select the data using gender categorization or age group or geographical regions or data sources. For the time being, I am just selecting the gender categorization. So that will give you the total number that you saw on the top of the graph. It, 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 on the top it says that it is showing you 1,893 visits for one syndrome in one location during the time period that you specified because we selected previous one month. And you can always copy this and paste it into Excel and if you want to do any, any kind of other graphs or anything that you want to make out of this, you can very well do that. And if you want to further slice the data, there is an option to go for a bivariate classification. So if I select like gender categories and age group, I should be able to see that that data in a tabular form. Again, you can copy this and paste it in an Excel uh, spreadsheet, and if you want to make some reports or something like that, you can do that. So in general, this is the, the front end of the system is very simple, and uh, basically what I think is that if you learn to use Facebook by yourself, you should have no difficulty in using this system. On the left side, there are different options. If you want to save this view, you can do that. You can give a particular name. Say, for instance, let, let us classify this as motor vehicle crashes. And then if you want to give a description for that, okay, whatever you want, like the number of cases that I saw when I looked at the system, whatever description that you want to give, you can give it here in the description box. And then it gives you two options. You can select a sliding option or a fixed option. If you select the fixed option, whenever you click this again, you will be seeing the same thing. But if you are selecting the sliding option, it will give the information for the previous one month period because that is what we selected initially. So I am going to save this because you know, that is needed for some showing some of the other options on the left side. I'm just giving some fake um, description and then I'm going to save it. So once you save this, what is going to happen is that at the bottom of the screen, the same thing will appear. You can see MVC and if I go back and come back after a week and if I click on that 
particular um, item it will show the numbers for the previous one month period from the day from that day backwards so you don't have to do all the other things you don't have to enter other information if you are in a hurry to get information So the second option, you don't have to go back to the original screen to make any modification for your search. You can modify it from this screen. And that again gives the same items that we saw when we tried to log in first. That is what, where, and when. So I'm going to click on what. And then I can, I can select something else, uh, anything. I can, I can just select maybe poisoning by medicine. So once I select two conditions, it gives me an option whether to compare that information or whether I want to combine that. So for instance, if you are looking for some gastrointestinal conditions like gastric hemorrhage and uh, diarrhea, you can search for those two conditions and see whether you can compare them or you can see the information as a combined search. And if I click on that, it will bring another graph. That will show the two separate items on, as you can see at the bottom. One is for the motor vehicle accidents and the other is for poisoning by medicines for the same time period for the same geographical region. So if you are interested in uh, monitoring for a particular condition and if you want to uh, compare the situation about two related conditions, you can very well do that. So I'm going to go back to uh, motor vehicle traffic accidents again. And the next option is probably if you want to see the situation for a particular or a status of a particular condition in your ge geographical region and a neighboring county. So for instance, if you want to combine, compare the situation in Kanawha County with the whole state of West Virginia, you have the option to do that. So what we are seeing right now is a graph comparing the motor vehicle accidents in the whole state of West Virginia and the same thing in Kanawha County for the same time period. So if you want to see whether your situation is much better or worse than the whole uh, state average or national average kind of thing, you can do that. And it's the uh, same thing that you can do if you want to see the situation um, for a different time period, you can do the same thing. You can you can create two separate graphs and compare the situation of both a particular condition at present and with a previous time period. And again, uh, you can make selections about the sources and if you want to make any changes in your search, for gender classification or age ranges, you can do that here. This gives you the options, as I said, like uh, this syndromic surveillance system, like many other systems, uh, also has some built-in statistical procedures uh, if you want to really use them. And you can get additional information about those statistical procedures from the library that I showed before. And once you save some information and if you want to note some additional information about that particular thing, you can, you can use this window to add your notes for future use. And this window gives you the option to share this particular information with others. So you can share that particular view with other people in, the, in your organization or you can share that with the entire Biosense community. And this is another option, but that is uh, uh, we haven't fully enabled at this time. Uh, the ordinary users can export the daily totals. And let, let, let me try to show you that.
So if you click on this export daily totals button, it is going to export that information as a CSV file. And then if you want to do some uh, reports or anything like that using that information, you can use that data. This is in addition to the tabular data option that we have seen before. I'm sorry, it is taking a bit long time. Yeah, yeah, here, here. Okay, here you have that information uh, made available to you. You can use that. Another option that is that we have enabled for all users is uh, for exporting the line level data behind this graph that um, usually if we want to do further analysis using for the J or so like additional um, analysis for uh, race or some other things, we can use that line level data. And another useful, very useful feature if you want to use this on a regular basis is that it has the ability, you don't have to run the system on a daily basis to see the numbers. You can set the system to send you an email alert when the number of cases or the percentage of visits for that particular syndrome exceeds a level that you can set up. So it gives me the option to send me an email and I can select whether I want to see that, get that email based on the number of visits or the percentage of visits. So if I select the number of visits and I can specify the time period whether that number should be related to a particular day or a particular week or a particular month, I can select it here and I can actually specify the number. So for instance, we have been looking at the motor vehicle accidents in West Virginia and if I want to get notified about that when the number exceeds say like 50 per week, I can set that off and the system will send me an email when that number exceeds for a particular or for a given week beyond the level that we have already specified here. So that is that is a very very useful feature like even if you don't have the time to um, look at the system on a daily basis, you you can always set the system to let you know that. So this, as I said, this is a very, very simple system and it is very easy to use. And as I showed in the previous slide, uh, CDC has a vendor dedicated for this program and they have a specific website if you need any additional help and they are very prompt in responding. From my experience, I can say that they have responded always within 24 hours. And if you have any questions or anything like that, you can always contact them. So I think that is all that uh, we want to include in this webinar. Now uh, let us see whether you have any questions. And I would, I would suggest you to use the QA and A tab you can type your questions there and then I can read that for the entire group and try to answer those questions.
Okay, I have a question here. Uh, this question from Trima Mays. I'm wondering if you are asking for local health departments such as Mid Ohio Valley Health Department to sign a memorandum of understanding that outlines what our role is with this system. I would expect that the regional AP would be utilizing the system to monitor disease outbreaks in our area based on data entered by hospitals and primary care providers in our area. But what is the role of the local health department? I'll try to answer this uh, to some extent. Of course, you do not need to sign a memorandum of understanding. Uh, all that we are requiring now is that you know you take the, the some uh, data security trainings that all the state employees are taking, and then you have to sign some documents. That is not a memorandum of understanding. But the main thing is that you can monitor the health status of the communities uh, that you are serving and see whether there is anything interesting happening. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, and uh, I think there are no questions at this time. But please feel to contact me if you have any additional questions, and um, we'll try to answer them at that time. Thank you all. Thank you very much.